right, yes, good morning. You may be seated. Before I just start, anybody else want to do this this morning? Um, so if you don't know, we are um, working our way through the book of Hebrews. In fact, this is the capstone of that. We are finishing up today. Let's see, I'm going to just a couple things here. Um, and so we've been going through for a year and a half on going through a verse-by-verse study of the book of Hebrews. And before um, I even talk about that, I guess I should remind you, we have some people coming around with the communion cups. If you're going to join us with communion this morning, and you're certainly welcome to if you're a believer. Um, and we're going to do it a little bit differently. That's why the cups are a little bit different. You can just hang on to them until we're there. All right, so we are going to go through the book of Hebrews today. A um, couple of background points of this. A year and a half ago, if you were here, we talked about the fact that I think, my opinion, I don't have any statistics on it, but I think Hebrews is one of the most overlooked books of the New Testament. It's very complicated. It has a lot of deep doctrinal statements. It, it never takes a pause, a breath, in terms of it opens with doctrine and it works its way all the way through. It's a very unique book in the New Testament and really all of Scripture. And also, as I've said before, it really is a book about Jesus Christ. Cover to cover, it's all about our faith, our trust, our hope in Jesus Christ and what he's personally done for us in ways that no other book of Scripture has ever presented as well as the book of Hebrews does. And so for me, a journey about 23 years ago now began where I started, was asked to teach a Bible study on Hebrews, and it came across my study that Somebody had said, one of the commentators said, we actually believe that Hebrews is a sermon. It, yes, it's recorded, and yes, it has some characteristics that make it look as if it's recorded, but much different than a letter, it was probably a sermon. And so from that, I said, wait a minute, what if I tried to memorize the book of Hebrews? And so I started that process. I think it was in 2021. I'm not really good at memorializing dates and things like that. But I started working through it, and the entire time I'm working through it, I'm thinking, I believe Paul wrote this letter, or gave the sermon, and I began to say, how would Paul emphasize this word, and how would Paul do these kind of things if he was delivering it in English, which I'm sure he probably wasn't, um, but you know, how would Paul do all that? And so that's how I began to memorize scripture, and please, as I say before, this is not about me. Lots of people have memorized way more scriptures than I have, including Satan, and so I don't want to compete with Satan in that, so this is not about pride or anything like that. This is about what I think my expectation in the entire study of the book of Hebrews was to increase our understanding, increase what our ability to know what Paul is saying through this book is. And I hope today, as we take a whole bunch of however long you've been a part of it, if today's your first day, welcome, it's an unusual day, but uh, if, you know, if you've been through it the whole, whole time, I think you'll be able to put things together a little more succinctly if you hear it. I think the way it was intended to be done, which is in one direct, specific setting. Okay. So a couple of caveats to that. Um, I'm going to go through the entire book of the 13 chapters of Hebrews. Um, it's all in the New King James Version. Okay? So if you're following along, you can watch as, I, as we go. It won't be on the screen as far as the actual verses of all of that. But you can keep along, and, you'll, and there's a couple of things. You know, A, number one, or A, one, whatever, uh, is I may not um, do every single word exactly verbatim as it is. Now, some of that's intentional, just because I've tried to make it more, sound more convenient or listenable in an you know, English sermon. Okay? There's one place where I intentionally change things, and we can talk about that if you catch it and you really want to make sure that you recognize I've, I've done that. The last thing is Hebrews repeats certain phrases multiple times, like Jesus sitting on the right hand of the throne of God and a number of other things. That little phrase can get my brain going from chapter 1 to chapter 9 like that. And if I don't catch myself, I could be in chapter 9 and miss a whole bunch of chapters. So I try to watch that and have my scriptures on the screen. The other thing is I know I can talk really fast. In fact, I could cover this in probably half the time if I wanted to go super fast. I'm going to try and make sure that my words are clear and articulate and slowing down. And, in for, and for that, I might be looking here. Okay. So anyway, just so you know, that's what we're doing. Last couple of points. It, I love the book of Hebrews cover to cover, but chapter 1 and chapter 2 make it really challenging for you as the audience to really get the flow of what Paul's talking about. In the sense that first chapter 1 is like 85% quotes from the Old Testament that he's piecing together to make his point that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay? 
chapter 2 does some of the same things, and it seems a little confusing. Like, is he talking about man, or is he talking about Christ? And so I'm going to try to help you as much as I can. Stick with it. By the time we get to chapter 3, I think the flow of this entire letter will be very, very beneficial to hear how it flows out. Okay. So with that, I'm going to take a drink with my nervous dry voice. And we'll get started. All right, so here we go. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upheld all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Or I shall be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. I messed that up, sorry. For which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son till they have begotten you? And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels proves steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels." But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, 
to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all of his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house, as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm until the end. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering into his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us, as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his words. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter, and those to whom it was first preached could not enter because of disobedience, Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into his rest has himself also ceased From his works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And is, a, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then, 
that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said of him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, if it bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, it receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God would not be unjust if he forgot your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints, and you do minister. But we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, 
confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it is also impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of that hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of our souls, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us. Even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither the beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from their brethren. That is, from their brethren, though they've all come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy was not derived from them received tithes from Abraham, and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, <laughs> well, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood, being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has ever officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And yet it is far more evident, if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there's an annulling of that former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there's the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn, and he will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and who has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those priests, to offer sacrifices for sin. Back to our map. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, don't need daily to offer sacrifices for sin, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. 
We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and on their hearts I will write them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall have to teach his neighbor and say, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will have mercy, I will have compassion on their ignorance. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Now, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared in the first part, which were the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind that second veil, that part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, in which were the golden, I'm sorry, the, the, the golden altar and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while that first tabernacle was still standing. It was merely symbolic for this present time in which gifts and sacrifices were offered, which could not make him who performed the services perfect with regard to conscience. You see, it was concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer for sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of his death for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, that those who were called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. I'm going to take a break, and we're going to do communion and that centering verse on Christ entering into the holy place to offer his blood for our sins and our transgressions. So hopefully everybody still has one. These are, again, different than we've used before. 
So there should be a top layer to peel off where you get your wafer. That's the thin little membrane on top. And I, I'm almost certain these don't taste very good, but hey, sacrifice doesn't always have to taste good. I'm going to pray. Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. The body that he was willing to come in the flesh and offer and sacrifice on our behalf, Lord God. As it says, he was without spot and blemish, perfect in every way, well-pleasing and accepting of your perfect will for his life, Lord God. We thank you that he was willing to suffer, to endure, to go to the cross, to let your name be upon him and to bring glory, Lord God, to you through the bringing of many sons into that glory, through the offering of his body that he sacrificed for us, Lord. Jesus Christ, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for being our great and true high priest who serves the true tabernacle in heaven. Lord, we want to remember your great sacrifice that you made this day and remember that it cost you your flesh and your bones and your body, Lord God, a penalty that we could never pay on our own. You allowed your body to be nailed to a cross and suffer and die for us, Lord. So we take this wafer this morning in full remembrance that you died a death that we deserved in order to bring us life. And Lord, we thank you for your blood. We still marvel that you have used blood as the most precious and valuable commodity that this earth has ever known. Life is in the blood, and how much more life in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, does that blood give life to each and every soul who places our faith, hope, and trust in you for our salvation. We thank you for carrying that blood into the heavenly places. We thank you, Lord, for making an entryway for us to join you in eternity because your blood has covered the full multitude of our sins. We thank you for your sacrifice and for your blood, and we receive it once again this morning in memory. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew, that's got a kick to it. <clears throat> All right. Back at it. So if you're watching along, we are in first or I'm sorry, first Corinthians. <laughs> we are in Hebrews chapter nine, verse sixteen. We're getting there. Thank you for hanging in. All right. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, he took the blood of goats and calves and with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are merely copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with the blood of another, he would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that the judgment, so also Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, but not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, 
year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year because it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which were offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Do you see he takes away the first in order to establish the second? And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands and ministers daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and on their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there's remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of the faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Consider that anyone who rejected Moses' law died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Partly while you, became, partly while you suffered both trials and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. But now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who would draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not yet seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. But before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen and moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of that place that he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the fellow heirs with him of that same promise. For he waited for that city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child after she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, by one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And all of these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that place from which they had come out, they would have, would have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly city. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared that city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming in the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they all passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, Whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so, without faith, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. And what more shall we take? For the time would fail for me to tell you of Gideon and Barak, Jephthah, Samson, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were, became strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, 
that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in mountains and deserts and mountains. And, uh, I'm sorry, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and slept in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these died in faith, not having received the promises. God having provided something better for us, that we should not be made perfect, or they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostilities from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Look, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Therefore, if you are enduring chastening, God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you would be illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. It's painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and our feeble knees, and make straight paths for our feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest there be any root of bitterness springing up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person for, who for one more, uh, like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. For you have not come to the mountain which may not be touched, and which burn with blackness, and darkness, and fire, and tempests, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word would not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood which speaks of better things than that of Abel. See then that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he's promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but all of heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of the things that are made, so that the things which cannot be shaken will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace with which we may serve God acceptably with reverence 
and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, let brotherly love continue. And do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if you were chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and that bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Therefore, let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. (laughs) What can man do to me? Now, remember those who rule over you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, do not be carried about by various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established in grace. Not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. For we have a table from which those who serve at the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people in his own blood, was suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp of Israel, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city here, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for it is they who are watching out for your souls. Therefore, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace, who brought up the Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of this exhortation, for I have written to you in a few words, and know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I will see you if he comes shortly. Greet those who rule over you, and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. All right, well, I don't have to do that ever again. Okay, sorry, no. Actually, that's not true. I was invited to do it at another church a couple of weeks ago, maybe, possibly, anyway. Anyway. Hmm. All right. Well, again, I hope, A, you enjoyed it, found something valuable out of it, uh, that you, maybe, maybe you might understand a little bit more about the author's intent of this book to encourage all who have faith in Christ to remain pure in their faith to endure all sufferings, all persecutions, endure it faithfully until the end so that we will indeed receive the promise that God has given to us. Okay. Again, we've gone through a year and a half of a really important book, a book that I obviously love, but I hope that it's been valuable to you. Okay. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to do this. I pray that you will cover the multitude of, uh, of sins and mistakes that may have been uttered here by me this morning uh, in the presentation of this, but Lord, I want to give you all the glory. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your apostle Paul who gave us this word. I thank you, Lord, that you are the God who is worthy of all praise, worthy of all honor. You're the God who came in the flesh and suffered and died for us, that we might be given to you in the kingdom of God through your sacrifice made on our behalf. Lord, we thank you once again for the study and ask you to bless each and every person that's here. Let each one of them receive what you have for them by the Holy Spirit's influence and power and work in their life, Lord God, to the glory 
and to the authority of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hey, so we have prayer teams up front, and I hope you have a wonderful, blessed day.